Good morning, church family. Um, it is great great to be out here at Howard and Deb's place. Very thankful for Howard and Deb and their ministry to us, sharing their home and hospitality. Also very thankful for um, our church, and particularly I think about uh, our church leadership and our plurality of elders. Um, super thankful for Brad and him preaching and teaching uh, Sunday in and Sunday out during the year. But it is really cool for us to be able to to be able to, as elders, come up and uh, and fill the pulpit and, and help out um, and give Brad that vacation that he so richly deserves. Also thankful for Justin, Evan, and Tim who are going to step up in the next number of weeks and and uh, and share what God has placed upon their hearts up here as well. Um, feeling the heat, most definitely. So really the sweat is only 10% nervousness. The rest is just heat uh, generated for sure. Um, and also, uh, yeah, let me just say that when we get together and when we preach and teach, uh, 99% of the time, we are teaching to adults in the congregation. Um, and so, and, and that's right and that's good. And a lot of times we don't necessarily preach directly to the kids. There's seldom that we're able to address the kids. And that's all right, and that's rightly so, because parents, it's your primary responsibility to teach your kids. So, you know, elders, the lead pastor, we're investing in, in you folks and we're investing in parents. And then in turn, parents are investing in their kids. But I just want to take a moment here and address the kids and ask them two quick questions. Okay. Kids, have you guys ever written a letter? Has anyone written a letter? Yeah. You guys are nodding, right? Letter like on that, on that thing that like, antique iPad, we call it a notepad, adults call it a notepad, using those old instruments, pencils and pens, right? So a letter you write on a piece of paper, maybe you're sending a letter to grandpa and grandma, maybe you're sending a letter to, to friends who are far, you take that letter, that you take that notepad and you write that letter out and you peel it off and you put it in an envelope and you put a stamp on it, an address, drop it in a mailbox and it goes away. Then it goes, eventually gets to your friend, your family, your grandparents. Well, this Ephesians book that we're going to be studying today is a letter. That's really what that is. And this is a letter from the Apostle Paul that was written while he was in prison in Rome, and it was sent to the church in Ephesus. So Ephesus was a community in Turkey, and uh, it's no longer with us. It was um, destroyed in about 614 uh, A.D., 614 A.D. by earthquake. 614, that's an interesting number. Kids, what year is it? Anybody shout it out? What year are we in right now? Can you guys tell me? 2021, right? 2021. So 2021 is 2021 years from something that happened. The big thing that happened was the death of Christ upon the cross. The whole world recognizes that. And our calendar is set in years past that date. So we're at 2021 years past Christ's death. So Ephesus was destroyed by earthquake in 614. So that's 614 years after Christ had died. This letter that Paul wrote was written around 60. So 60 years, 60, 61 years after Christ's death. So that is doing the math quickly. Pilot, don't have my first officer with me to help me. Uh, we're about... 1,960 years ago that this letter was written, so a really, really long time ago. Um, when we read through Ephesians, when we read through this letter, it's important to note that the book is divided into two clear sections. Paul's writings in the first three chapters, chapters 1, 2, 3, is spent discussing God's creation of a holy community by his gift of grace through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This community, his church, having been chosen by God, through the work of Christ, we, adopted as sons and daughters of God and brought to the Father through faith in his Son, all with faith were dead in their sins, but were made alive because of person and work of Jesus Christ. So building on this truth, the section lays out Paul's call for the church to be holy and walk in a way in accordance with our calling, believing who we are in Christ manifests itself and how we govern ourselves without our, within our relationships in our community, our work relationships, and as we're going to explore today, our marriage relationship. So folks, take a moment, grab your Bible. Let's turn to Ephesians 5, starting at verse 25. 
If you don't have your Bibles, your electronic device, whatever is uh, working for you this morning. So picking up at verse 25, Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. Because we're members of his body, therefore man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, I'm saying, that refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife and himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Let's take a moment and pray. Lord God, thanks for this day. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here speaking to my brothers and sisters. Um, Thank you for uh, just drawing them here, hearing the word, Lord God. Father, might it not be my words, might it be you speaking through me, Lord God, by the gifting of the Holy Spirit, Father. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for who he is to us in the church, Father. I thank you for our call as husbands to love our wives. Wives call to respect our husbands and Father, I just pray that this morning that I would speak softly and, uh, and diligently, and I pray that you would just use me. Father, these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So as I've been preparing for this message, it's a super good reminder of me and some of the things I haven't necessarily been doing in loving my wife. Um, and so as I've been reading, prepping, I've come to, um, to be extremely thankful for my wife. Never, uh, never so much as this morning when I left the house, got to the car, opened my door, she came out and she said, got your Bible, got your notes? Yep, in the back seat. Are you sure? Uh, yeah, I think so. How about these? These ones right here? So my wife is a compliment to me. I'm very thankful for her and uh, she definitely helps me out. Okay. There's a lot of teaching material in this section and many excellent sermons can be drawn from this passage. However, as I said earlier, I'd like to focus on verse 33. However, let each of you love his wife as himself and let the wife sees that she respects her husband. As we discuss and explore Paul's call towards love and respect, I'd like to break down our time into three, three separate sections. Working through the why of love and respect, the how to love and respect, And lastly, what I would call is the application of what love and respect can look like in our marriages. Before I start, um, and and this is me being firm, before I start, if you hear one thing clearly and the rest you pick up are bits and pieces of the message, hear this. Listening through your ears, this message is for you. Don't lose your message dwelling on thinking, oh, my wife really needs to hear this, or oh, I hope my husband is listening. See, we often do this with messages that hit very close to home, that hit close to our hearts. It's easier to focus on someone else's benefit rather than our own call towards growth. See, when we do this, we're robbing ourselves of the pursuit of holiness, a life better lived and a relationship better enjoyed. So the why. Verse 33 is a call for husbands to love our wives. For wives, you are called to respect your husbands. We mentioned that already. Many Christian authors would say that this is because women are gifted to love. And men are God gifted towards respect. Authors would even go so far as to say that women speak in a love driven language and men speak in a respect driven language. While I do see this in our culture as generalities between men and women, I'm not 100%, 100% convinced that this was God's design in the beginning. To get back on point, why does Paul have to tell husbands to be loving, going further, to be loving as Christ is loving, to be loving sacrificially? Wives need to be respectful of their husbands. Men, he's doing this because we need to be encouraged to be loving, and wives need to be encouraged to be respectful. 
This is if men have always struggled to be loving and women have always struggled to be respectful. Not just the generation that he's speaking to in the Ephesians, but I'd put it to you that all generations past and present wrestle with this issue. For women to be respectful is a risk. For men to be loving is also a risk. This risk must come as a result of some sort of deep wounding. The only wounding I can think of that could impact generationally like this would be Adam and Eve's fall in the garden. Let's look at the Genesis account. Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree, that it is the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it. Don't even touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You'll not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be to desire to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord walk. They, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden, in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said, "Where are you?" And he said, "I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself." He said, "Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat?" The man said, The woman whom you gave me, gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. What's important to see is that Adam was present during this dialogue between Eve and between the snake, between Satan. He was right there. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Adam's great failure, his loss of respect in Eve's eyes, was the moment he blamed Eve for their sin choice. His better choice, the best choice, would have been to protect Eve from the lie, to reiterate God's truth. Eve, no, we may eat of every tree, but of this one we may not eat of. Then trample the stake for speaking against God, putting the serpent under his heel. Instead, Adam, before buses were even made, threw Eve under one. This woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Adam failed to lead, failed to enforce God's word, and failed to protect Eve from deception. As a result, respect was lost. Eve's failure was her unbelief in the word of her creator, her heavenly father. She loved herself more and her desire for wisdom was greater than her love for God and obeying his word. Further, we read, her failure resulted in pain during childbirth, as well as a desire for her husband. The desire for her husband could be a reference to a pursuit of loving intimacy with her husband. Not just these results, but ultimately the loss of intimacy with her Heavenly Father, the most fulfilling love relationship that was ever experienced by a human being. This could be an area of where Adam resented Eve. As a result of the fall, I would put it to you that man has been driven to re-establish respect and when and women have been driven towards rebuilding love. As an outflow of this theory, let's look at our present culture. Predominantly, we see men respect-driven and women love-driven. Let's first look at women. Who in our homes, our workplaces, our businesses use words of love the most? Men or women? I love your hairdo. Who's your hairstylist? I love your dress. Is that new? These are words predominantly used by women. With men, you see the drive towards respect. When guys, you witness a first meeting between two men, inevitably a conversation may go along the lines of, what do you do? Who do you know? What do you drive? As in, how much do you make? Men are very hierarchical. We see this in family life and social settings, and mostly, predominantly, we see this in work, and we definitely see this in the military, of course. Men are often task-driven, 
developing respect through the completion of tasks. The more difficult the task, the more respect is given. An example of this would be the respect we have for the guy that builds his own house. Or the fellow that rebuilt the old car that he drives. Women are very relational, experiencing love through the building of relationships. Often my wife will come home and share a story or issue about work. Inevitably, being a guy, I look to solve the problem. Well, you should have said this. Instead of listening, I need to solve the issue for her. When really all she's looking for is connect to time through me experiencing some of the same things she experienced during the day. I've learned that when the story comes up, sometimes I need to just ask, is this something you need help with? Do you need me to fix it? Or do you just need me to listen? Often the answer is, I just need you to listen. What about when men and women are interacting in the same settings? We see these differences. I've witnessed these differences when we go searching for Christmas trees with our families, with our kids. We men in our family are looking for a tree that meets the bill. Tall, full of branches, and of course, at a good price. My girls are all about looking for the perfect tree. It won't be the first one or the second one. You see, they'll know it's the right tree, the perfect tree, because when they see it, a course of angels will sing, ah. You see, for the girls, looking for trees is about creating a meaningful memory, a meaningful experience for the kids and for the family. For us guys, it's about the completion of the task. It's about hunting the tree, shooting the tree, bagging the tree, getting it home, all before the puck drops. You see, we're different. And there's many, many examples that one can use to show our differences. But I would say at our core, our differences will boil down to men have a deep desire to be respected and women have, and women have a deep desire for relationship to be loved. Husbands and wives. Paul sees us and encourages us to apply his love and respect message because the need is just as evident in the Ephesian church as it is in our present culture and church. So what happens when we aren't practicing love and respect in our marriage? Well, life can be kind of like a train wreck for our families. I've been thinking long and hard to draw an analogy of this, and I think I come up with, with something I think works and is personal. When my brother and I were young, we received an electric train set for Christmas. For two younger boys, it was a super, super cool present. We laid the track in an oval pattern that the instructions showed for two young kids, it required a lot of patience for us to put together. And after setting up the track, we carefully placed the locomotive on the track, followed by each car connecting to the one in front. Then we hooked up and plugged in the controller. You see, to advance the train down the track, we moved the little controller lever on, on the controller, which added more electricity to the train and it would go faster. The more we advanced the lever, the faster and faster the train went. All ran well up until we got to the corner. If we weren't careful and we're going too fast, we derail part of the train. We lose a car at the back, dragging the car around the track. Or worse, derailing the whole train on the corner. My brother and I took turns oper operating the controller and running the train and resetting the cars after they tip over. Well, let's look at the family life like this train and track. The train represents the health of the family, and mom and dad are working the controller. Mom's hand on the controller, and dad's hand on hers. See in scripture, the two shall become one. And let's give each corner of the oval, each turn a name. At one end, you have the respect turn, and at the other end, you have the love turn. And as long as mom and dad are careful and work as one, the family moves around the, tack, around the track, especially careful on those love and respect corners. Well, if on one corner they're not paying attention to each other, and maybe one's pushing the controller and one's pulling back, each moving selfishly, we're going to have a derailment. Then someone has to go over and reset the cars and reset the motion of the train, the family. See, now we move into the how. Dr. Emerson Egrich, a Christian author and counselor, he would call this the crazy cycle. Without love... She defensively removes her respect, and without respect, he defensively removes his love. Paul's goal in Ephesians 5.33 is to get couples working in harmony, or what Emerson would call the energized cycle. 
His love for his wife motivates her respect, and her respect for her husband motivates his love. How do you do this? How do you get off the crazy cycle? Or how do you improve towards the energized cycle? I would tell you, in of ourselves, it's very difficult. That's why Paul spent the first half of Ephesians laying down scripture, establishing who we are in Christ. It must be done at a heart level. It must be done especially when it's undeserving. There's sacrifice involved. Let's take a brief look at the first few chapters of Ephesians to see what Paul was referring to. Chapter 1, I would say, highlights prayer. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory through Christ. You see, you can sacrificially give to your spouse something undeserved because you have the joy of the gospel in your life. Also, you have the Holy Spirit in your corner, the helper. Listen to the Holy Spirit as you seek to honor your spouse. Romans 8.26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Pray through times of frustration. Recognizing like you, you make mistakes. Just as Christ has forgiven you, you need to have a heart of forgiveness towards your spouse. In chapter 2 in Ephesians, we see repent highlighted. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing it is the gift of God not a result of works so that no one may boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them see just as we are dead in sin we need to be dead to our past sins with our spouse in order to do this we need to repent and seek forgivenesses for when we haven't been loving or haven't been respectful I get it's not an easy task but it's one that will bring healing to a relationship. In chapter 4, we see wise counsel highlighted. Rather than speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, the whole body, that's us folks, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. See, as we pursue Christ-likeness in our lives, the community, the church benefits and grows as well. As you pursue a love and respect bond in your marriage, invite a few others from your church community to speak and pray with you. Proverbs 27.9, Oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. And lastly, and thanks for your patience, folks. I appreciate it's warm. Lastly, the application. What does it look like to be loving to your wife, guys? Ladies, what are some ways in which you can be respectful to your husband? As we explore the application of love and respect, I'll be using again some suggestions from Dr. Egerich. He has come up with two acronyms that will be helpful for us. And for the ladies, it's CHAIRS, C-H-A-I-R-S. And for the guys, it's COUPLE, C-O-U-P-L-E. CHAIRS stands for CONQUEST. Hierarchy, authority, insight, relationship, sexuality. And couple stands for closeness, openness, understanding, peacemaking, loyalty, and esteem. So let's start with the ladies. Chairs. Ladies. In chairs, the C is conquest. Please understand and appreciate that your husband is driven towards work. work. <clears throat> Genesis 2.15 2, says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. We as men are wired to work. When our job is belittled, we're made to feel bad about the hours we have to put in at work. We can feel deflated. We're not only working for the need for accomplishment and respect, we're working to be providers for you and for our family. 
Understanding this drive and showing appreciation for your husband when he comes home or before he goes to work will go a long way in building respect. H and A is hierarchy and authority. And I'd like to put those together. I'm going to refer to them as leadership. Ephesians 5.23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. And Ephesians 5.22, Submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And folks, I appreciate for some this is a tough area to work through. Submitting means risk, I get it. So recognizing the delicacies of this call on you ladies, I'd like to spend a bit more time in this area. Understanding how we're wired to think and deal with situations is important. Some of this would appear to be beyond our control. Often our family of origin, where we come from, and how we're raised, dictates what we believe to be normal or true and how we respond in our relationships. It's important, we need to realize that each of us are sinners saved by grace and that our parents are no exceptions. Our parents are sinners just like us. The Bible in Genesis and Exodus speaks about the sins of the father impacting on the third and fourth generation. Without going into a ton of detail, we're impacted by how we're raised, both good and bad, and each of us carries to some degree baggage. So knowing that, we shouldn't let our family of origin experience dictate solely what we believe to be true or how we respond to situations because our experience can be tainted by sin. We need to go to scripture to learn how to conduct ourselves in our daily lives, particularly in this area of spousal love and respect. This called respect isn't done just when deserved. It's done unconditionally. Just as Christ died for us unconditionally, that's how ladies you're supposed to give respect unconditionally, especially when it's undeserved. That's not to say that you're in an abusive relationship that you should continue to allow yourself to stay in that situation. If that's the case, you both need to seek professional help. And ladies, you may need to get to safety for a time. What I am saying is that all things being equal, and your husband is genuinely trying to lead, let him lead. Recognize that he'll make mistakes and he'll grow through them. If you're still struggling, let me make one last point. If you recognize that he has the responsibility to protect and provide for you and your family, you should recognize that he also has primary responsibility to lead the family. Or maybe you insist on being egalitarian, egalitarian marriage, being that all people are equal and deserve equal rights and opportunities. A marriage where you both have equal authority, yet contradict egalitarianism by expecting him to be primarily responsible for safety and, pro and for providing. When you hear a bump in the night outside or downstairs, do you say, honey, you went last time, I'll go check it out this time. Yeah, probably not. You see, if you're comfortable standing behind him in the face of danger, trusting that he would sacrifice himself for you and your family, you should be okay standing behind him when you're both facing tough decisions. That's not to say that a husband should run the house autocratically and every decision should be made by him and go through him. That's silly. There's lots of decisions that Carla, my wife, makes that are right in her wheelhouse. And there's decisions that I make that are in my realm of responsibility. Then there's the really big decisions that we talk about. And in the end, I'll need to make, do we move to Thunder Bay? Do we sell our house? Do we buy a new one? If so, how much do we spend? Then we discuss, but ultimately, ultimately, someone has to say yay or nay. Ladies, you show respect when you honor your husband by trusting him to lead. Understanding that leadership isn't a right, it's a responsibility. Husbands, you're called to lead as Christ leads the church. That's sacrificially, putting the needs of the family before yourself. Now we come to insight. Because the Bible teaches that it was Eve who was deceived, 1 Timothy 2.14. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became the transgressor. Ladies, are you aware that, they, that there may be moments when your feelings can mislead you and that you may ignore your husband's counsel? Please, please realize that as husbands and wife, you are a team and that your intuition and your husband's insight go hand in hand. You're respectful when you test your intuition against his insight seeking his counsel and listening to what he has to say. Relationship. The Bible clearly teaches that a wife should be her husband's friend 
as well as his lover. Ladies, you show respect when you recognize the value of just being with him as his friend. Men enjoy shoulder-to-shoulder time with other men. Whether it's accomplishing a task, playing a sport, or going fishing, I've been asked by Carla on numerous occasions, how was your time with Josh? It was great, I'd reply. What did you talk about, she'd ask. Nothing, I'd say. Sometimes. I'm saying sometimes, not all the time. Men just need shoulder-to-shoulder time. It's the companionship. The time sacrifice, that's important to men. As guys, we know and appreciate the responsibilities we each face in the busyness of one another's lives. Being shoulder-to-shoulder with a guy who's giving up some time to be with you is big. Doing so and just experiencing quiet with no decisions or obligations attached is just as huge. It's like a mutual time out. Time out from life. Or a recharge time for your electric vehicle. Shoulder to shoulder, guy to guy. <coughs> and lastly, ladies. Sexuality. Proverbs 5.19 talks about lovely deer, graceful doe, as well as other things I won't get into this morning. All I'm going to say in this context this morning is, ladies, you're blessing your husband when you understand or open to meeting his needs for physical intimacy. Ladies, thank you for your patience. Thank you for listening. We're almost done here, guys. Okay, gentlemen, couple. Pay attention, because as we're reading through 25 to 33, there's a lot on guys here to be sacrificial. So a couple. C, closeness. Generation, uh, yeah, sorry, in Genesis 2.24. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. One flesh, gentlemen. We are told to leave and cleave. When my, when my wife and I have one-on-one time, she is energized. We may discuss the topics of the day or major issues as they come up, as I said earlier. I've learned early on in our marriage that this, the decisions we make need to be first discussed together. Then, if applicable, we could seek outside counsel. My past mistake was that I'd tell her, hey, Dad and I already discussed the problem, we worked out a solution, and here's the plan. As wise as my father is, he's not my wife. <clears throat> In this scenario, I'm really not leaving and cleaving. Instead, I'm devaluating I'm devaluing my wife's input and causing strife in the marriage. Don't get me wrong, wise counsel is good to get. Just make sure that's a decision that you both agreed on and consider both agreeing on who that counsel is going to be. Openness, Colossians 3.19, Husbands, love your wives, do not be harsh with them. As husbands, we are not to be harsh or resentful towards our wife. When we're feeling put out with our wife, we need to ask, is this really a her issue or is it a me issue? See, for me, most of the time I found out it's a me issue. Most of the time, my goal is being blocked, and I need to work through my frustration at having a blocked goal. Some of the best conversations we've had, husband and wife, has been on the backside of, a, of an apology by me. When we've had an opportunity to talk through the reason for the frustration, we learn, we learn more about how to potentially avoid that frustration. Setting mutual goals together helps. Understanding, 1 Peter 3, 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wife in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Living in an understanding way means I need to be attentive to her womanly concerns because I want to make her feel understood and cared about. I may not agree with her concerns, however, I need to engage and listen to them, not make light of them, or be dismissive when she brings them up. When you listen to your wife's concerns, do you try to fix your wife? Or the situation that she's sharing with you? Well, you should have said this, you should have done that. Newsflash, guys, your wife doesn't need you to fix her. And peacemaking, Matthew 19.5. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Men, we should always be seeking to be at one with our wives. If there's an issue between, between you, is it your wife or you that brings it up to work through? I'd bet dollars of donuts and most of the time it's her. 
what would it look like for us as men to start the conversations? As men, God's given us a responsibility to lead our homes. That would definitely have been the area of Christ-likeness. And as a natural outflow, may include an apology. Dropping an issue and moving on without exploring it seldom ends well. It just adds to the others and simmers just below the surface. Loyalty, Malachi 2.14. Though she is your companion and your wife by covenant, guys, it's a good idea to repeatedly let her know of your devotion. Do you admire pretty women or do you save your admiration for her alone? In a world where so many marriages are in turmoil, you need to know that assuring her of your loyalty calms her heart. And lastly, esteem. 1 Peter 3.7 says of our wives that we are to honor as fellow heirs of the grace of life. We need to esteem our wives. Another word for esteem could be treasure. We need to treasure our wives. Remembering birthdays and anniversaries should be a given. While we're here, let's chat about those special days. What are you doing on those days to treasure her? Look for ways specific to her to show that you've been thinking about her before her birthday or anniversary. Did you notice a dress that she was admiring last month? Did you remember the restaurant her friend said was amazing? Of course, just not the special days. Look for ways whenever she comes to mind to show her she's treasured. A text midday to ask how she's doing. Filling her car up with gas when it needs it. Just telling her how much you appreciate how her gifts impact the family. All simple things that go a long way to show that she's treasured. Guys, these are all good examples of what it means to love your wife. It's important to remember that as men, you're different from your wife. The things that are important to her may not be important to you. By choosing to make these things important to you, you're showing your wife that she is important to you. So in closing, let me acknowledge that love and respect is not easy, especially when we're giving it undeservedly. It requires sacrifice, prayer, and help. My prayer for you would be that you do it in a way that would show that Christ is at the center of your life and that his love and forgiveness is enough for you to find joy in. Lastly, as you consider this, it's often been said that our children will grow up and marry someone just like us, what they know and what they are used to. When we practice love and respect, we'll give them sound teaching by example and a view of what a biblical, healthy marriage can look like. 